Yeah, we did this at Neil's house in the country. The idea was to just do it really simply, um, be very simple programming. And Neil had bought a few guitars. And so basically it was just put down a very simple rhythm track, bass and drums, and then put guitar on it. <laughs> well, it, it, <laughs> Wasn't was, it? it was you that decreed at the beginning of this that there was going to be a totally new Pet Shop Boys. Oh, was it? Um, we're going to do everything differently. That's why Farrow didn't sign the cover. Um, cover artwork. So Possibly yeah. one of our best sleeves as well, isn't it? It's a good, it's a good sleeve. Um, no, I'm, only joking. I'm only one didn't mark up there. <laughs> so we were kind of, this is where we decided to reboot the Pet Shop Boys in a different way. So my house is in County Durham and I had a guitar and Chris asked me to play the guitar on something. I, I think it was for some birthday boy. And then we used that as an excuse to go to Newcastle and buy three guitars. Um, and then we started putting them on the album. I used to go quite defensive when it came out because people used to call it our acoustic album. And I was always supposed to go, it's actually made no different than other albums, really, because it's basically pro. No, we just chose different sounds. So all the drum sounds, we chose, we chose real yeah. drum sounds rather than electronic drum sounds. But it's still, it was still all programmed. It just sounded different. And then we asked Johnny Marr to come up and play. This is the, this is the album that Johnny Marr, who's played on I think four of our albums, but um, this is the one he plays the most on. He's on two thirds of the tracks, I think. And then he came up for about a week and played on everything. And so it was a, it was a very different sounding Pet Shop Boys. Again, though, if you listen through this two bonus albums, two further listening albums, you can see we could actually have put out a completely different album, which would be more obviously electronic. Um, but we liked this idea we were going to do the whole sound completely different. And then, and then when the album was finished, we went on the, um, Chris had the suggestion, we went on a university tour like Paul McCartney and Wings had done in about 1971. We got a band with two guitarists and a percussionist and I played guitar and Chris played keyboards. And this tour, which went on in various forms for about three years, was a very, very good learning experience. I remember on the first night thinking, oh my God, there's no backing singers, there's no dancers. Um, it's quite frightening, really. And it was a very good learning experience, definitely, the whole, the whole thing. No, Ian McNeil designed the set, but it was very low key. And his big idea, which was we were playing theatres, was to just show the, the wall at the back of the theatre and light it, which is, very, which is a great look. And then there's a big moment where the star cloth came down during Love is a, Love is a Catastrophe, which was a beautiful moment. And it was, actually, it was a very, very enjoyable tour to do. It sort of changed us, actually. We, it was at that point that we started to think of ourselves as a group that went out and played live, which even during the nightlife era, we didn't really think of ourselves like that. Um, but from release onwards, that was part of the, that was a bigger part of the project. Well, always frustrated by preconceptions like the Pet Shop Boys, but it's sort of our fault, you know. But I mean, if you've made Go West and it's been a huge hit around the world, people are going to think you're going to sound like Go West, uh, the people with a casual interest. I remember Boy George said to us once, every artist has an albatross and every artist has their nemesis. And in a way, our albatrosses go west. I think he thinks his albatross is Karma Chameleon, by the way, which I think is a really good record. A Fleetwood Mac got an albatross. <laughs> yes, but their albatross is not their <laughs> albatross. <laughs> It's a very consistent sounding record. It's very, very personal. It's Pet Boys most personal album in terms of the lyrics from my point of view because a lot of it is about the sort of emotional situation I went through. And, it, and I think it's a very, very beautiful album, but it's, it's sort of underproduced, not overproduced, like the albums on either side of it. I think it's got some really, st I love, always like this, the song Home and Dry. Um, and uh, Birthday Boy. The last song you choose is one of my most beautiful songs, I think. Love is a Catastrophe. It's sort of a bit like, it's not like anything else we've ever done before or since. Um, I think it's, I find the album, I mean, listening to the remastering of it, I find the album really moving. It's actually one of my favourite albums we've made. Mm. It's interesting, when we were making the album, it was an album that Parlophone were really excited by. Parlophone really, really, really liked it. And the reason they wanted us to take I Didn't Get Where I Am Today off is because they didn't think we should have anything light-hearted on it, which that song sort of is. And so it's, um, it's quite an intense record. Well, we have a period here where we keep writing songs. 
So we keep writing songs after the album because the record company wants a greatest hits album and you've got to do a single of the greatest hits album. There's nothing more difficult than writing the single of the greatest hits album because you sort of know it's doomed not to be a hit. And we go through various strategies in doing that. We do some tracks with Elton John, who suggested doing a record with us. We suggested doing Alone Again Naturally by Gilbert O'Sullivan. So there's a duet with that, produced by Stargate. We do the That's song. That's an oxymoron for stars. What? A duet of Alone Again. Oh, <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean. <laughs> And then we did the song Miracles with Adam F and Dan Fresh. I got Anne Dudley to put an orchestra on it. And then finally we wrote a song that we thought was a single, Flamboyant, which indeed was a single. Um, and so we had the two singles, Miracles and Flamboyant. And so, this, so the bonus albums represent several years of writing, of songwriting. And I think you can see really musical range that again on this album we've chosen the more guitar based ones to go on it and there are other more electronic and different sounding songs like the song which I really like always which is very very electronic we even do Chris uh, did a remix of Home and Dry which we're doing on the tour at the moment where it's turned into it's, it's got no guitars and it. it's turned into a sort of electronic ambient version of it Wolfgang, we had a discussion with Wolfgang Tillman, who we'd met, about making a video, and he was going to shoot it in his flat. And it was about the absence of someone, which is what the song's about. And then there was a cut in with, a, with footage he, he shot of us performing at Heaven nightclub, just doing the song. And then we went to see him, he said, oh, I've changed the idea, I hope you don't mind. And he'd done this whole thing, he spent days at Tottenham Court Road, underground station, filming mice running up and down the tracks. I don't think we necessarily thought the video was extreme. I think we thought it was sort of cute, this thing with the mice running up and down. I thought it was a very clever image of travel, you know, of home and travel, because the song's about that. And the mice are living in this tube station. And it was a completely different, it's sort of a much rougher aesthetic, which seemed to go with the sound of the music to me. Um, we also had the idea on this album that we'd, all three videos for singles would be made with photographers. So Bruce Weber did the second video, and Martin Parr did the third video for London. We were working in Metropolis Studios with Stargate um, to do Alone Again, actually, with Elton John. And for some reason, Elton was delayed by a day or something. I don't know, something, I don't know what happened. Or maybe we didn't need the extra day to work on Alone Again, actually. And so we wrote this song with um, Reunion. They took it back to... Scandinavia and they did some more work in it but they gave it to someone we actually have a little controversy about this because it's called electro mix um, there's a much rougher mix which is in my opinion not a master quality uh, and this one is no one knows who did the mix no one knows yeah I was having a reunion with some friends I think in the diary it said reunion Newcastle reunion that's why I got the idea of reunion and there's a very beautiful song, but I think we wrote it after the album really called Always, which is on the, one of the bonus albums, which I think is one of the best songs of the whole period. And then someone had given me this box set, the famous box set of psychedelic nuggets, and, uh, which I used to have the vinyl album on. And the, uh, like the first or second track is this song called Father's Name Was Dad. And it had this great guitar riff, and I think it was in the same key. So we sampled it and put it onto, I didn't get around today, and then Johnny Marr came in and played guitar on the whole thing and played the, the Father's Name Was Dad riff. But it wasn't written around the riff, the song already existed. But it was sort of, it worked perfectly. The song was inspired by us going to see The Strokes' first UK performance, which was Heaven. When I came out, I had this tune in my head. So it's sort of a Strokes-inspired song. There's a song called The Night I Fell In Love and it comes from a cassette of something we'd done about six years beforehand. Actually, we did on the, um, on the last album, we had a B-side and again, it was something Chris and I wrote, actually in 1982. And, I could, and, I, and the reason I remembered it is because I'd 
it was going to this box of tapes, seeing something worth having, and this came up, and, and we recorded it, pretty much from memory, really. Oh, there's two songs could have been on, um, on release. Between Two Islands could have been on, and I Didn't Get Where I Am Today was on. Yeah. And Parlophone suggested taking it off, and for some reason we went along with that. And now it's, it puzzles me why we decided to do that. Well, that's probably the fundamental flaw that we get to choose. Yeah, we, we, should let, we should put it out to tender. Or, or let the fans have a vote. Normally, we just write a load of songs. And therefore, when we have a single coming out, you know, you think what we're going to put on the, as the bonus tracks. And you sort of look to see what we've got and maybe try and match it with the A-side. But we don't generally make specific B-sides. Uh, every track could have ended up on the album. And of course, with these reissues, it does. Yeah.